we often think that the actors would have had to get used to the moving indoors to play. But of course, they'd always played indoors because when they toured, they performed in guild halls, aristocratic houses. So it was when they went to London and the large open air playhouses, that must have been a bit of a challenge for them. Indoor playhouse is the first professional indoor playhouse is built in 1576, the same year as the first outdoor, permanent outdoor uh, playhouse, the theatre in the north of London. And that was occupied by a children's company. Uh, and it was in a part of the Blackfriars complex. Uh, it was run by a man called Richard Farrant. Uh, and that survived for a while. Uh, but then they closed down. Uh, and then we move forward a bit. And uh, James Burbage, who's built the theatre, realises that his lease is running out in 1597. And so he bought uh, not the same part of the Blackfriars Monastery that the earlier playhouse had been in, but a larger first floor space. And he paid £620 for it, so a big investment, and converted it to a playhouse. At that point, he was prevented from using it because the local residents didn't want they complained about the traffic noise, the noise of people leaving the theatre, etc. So he was left with this indoor playhouse. And uh, he died in 1597, the same year that his lease ran out. And his sons, Richard, his sons Richard and uh, Cuthbert, had to uh, lease the indoor playhouse to another children's company. The, the Children of the Queen's Revels, which is where Eastwood Ho was performed by that company there in 1605. And so indoor playing was clearly very attractive. For a start, it was warm and dry. Uh, they charged more, so roughly six times the price of the outdoor playhouse, and you could play in the winter. So... The boys stayed there, and then they got into trouble, for example, over Eastwood Ho. Uh, they sailed a bit too close to the wind with other things, and in 1608, they lost the use of their indoor playhouse, and the by then the king's men regained the use of it. And from that point, they played in the summer at the Globe, spring to autumn, and then they moved in the winter indoors. I think no one's quite sure why they didn't use both playhouses at the same time, and no one knows the answer to that. But it meant now that they had a totally different, two operations very different. They have the Globe, which they've built in 1599 to replace the theatre, on the South Bank, uh, an area uh, that operated in a sense, rather like uh, it is today, it was becoming a sort of entertainment centre. But they now had a playhouse in a slightly more salubrious bit of the city, north of the river. So they, in a sense, had two clientele and two very different kinds of theatre. Uh, and so at the Blackfriars now, indoor, lit by candles, six times as much to go in, an audience therefore socially narrower than at the Globe, which was, in a sense, anybody who had a penny could go there. So it, it, it enabled them, in a sense, to develop a, a sort of different repertoire. When they first had both playhouses, they played uh, more or less the same repertoire, inevitably. But you see plays now becoming written specifically for uh, indoors. And one of the things, again, that we don't really know is how did they move plays? The Duchess of Malfi performed indoors at the Blackfriars, outdoors at the Globe. It seems to me Webster wrote it for the Blackfriars. Everything about it 
seems to me to be an indoor play, but they did it outdoors at the Globe as well. And that's something really no one understands quite how they did that. Burbage put his uh, playhouse, in a sense, in a large existing space. And he built it with a stage at one end, with a tiring house, obviously where the actors dressed themselves, attired themselves. And because in the indoor playhouse, everyone is seated. No one stands now. Outdoors, stand in the yard, sit in the galleries. Here, everyone sits. So the audience sat in galleries that ran round the theatre and then in a pit in front of the stage. And then some of the audience would have been seated, as it were, at the back of the stage on the, on the balcony level, the middle of which was used by the actors at times and also by the musicians. So in effect, it's a theatre in the round. It's just not an even one. So then the prices were quite clear. The nearer you sat to the stage, the more you paid. So it started, the cheapest seats would have been in the second level of the gallery, what Ben Johnson calls the caves and wedges of the house, where he says the uh, sinful sixpenny mechanics sit, probably many of them the servants or attendants of the richer people going. Uh, and then the boxes at the side of the stage, so you're sitting on stage level within touching distance of the actors, are very expensive. But the thing you could do indoors that you couldn't do outdoors if you wanted to was to sit on the stage itself. And these stage sitters, I think always young men, out to be as much of the performance as they could manage to be, Johnson is scurrilous about them. They really drive him crazy with their daft questions and their interruptions. But they bring the company a lot of money. In fact, at another theatre, indoor theatre, the Salisbury Court, when, the, when it was decided they, the audience could not sit on the stage, the company were recompensed for that because of the loss of income, because it was considerable. So you've got people... Uh, of a higher social class. Sometimes people think that meant the audience were more appreciative. My experience is that people with more money aren't necessarily more appreciative of the theatre, but it was a very different. So they're all seated. Uh, the And the, the theatre is candlelit. So you've got a very different atmosphere now. There were windows for daylight, but they started at about two in the afternoon and certainly by the end of the afternoon, on a dull winter evening, there wasn't going to be much light coming through those windows. So the candles, I think, became more effective as you went further into the play. Uh, and it's interesting with a play like The Duchess of Malfi, it's the fourth act and the fifth act where the effect of the candles are most needed. And I think Webster knew exactly that by about quarter to four, four o'clock, it was going to work for him to have the candles. The other great thing about indoors is the amount of music. The Blackfriars music, as it was called, the Blackfriars Orchestra, were the most celebrated musicians in London. And people would go an hour before the performance and sit to listen to the musicians play. And indeed, one member of the audience who was a regular, uh, Bolstrode Whitelock, he composed his own music, Whitelock's Coranto, which when he appeared in the theatre, the orchestra would strike up and he would make his way to his favourite seat uh, accompanied by the music. So uh, I think there must have been, uh, there's sort of almost like a, at times a sort of private club atmosphere where a lot of people would have known each other. Um, where people obviously were there to make an impression. Uh, it's uh, it's often when people talk about the audience of an indoor candlelit theatre, they often the word that often comes up is lustre. And I think that with the jewels uh, and the decorated theatre, the costumes of the actors and the candlelight, it must it must have been captivating. 
and and I think therefore you got such a totally different experience indoors. Not better than outdoors, different, uh, intimate, music drenched. I think so much music used, used in the plays and before. The candlelight and the candlelight can be flexible. You can change what we would think of as a lighting state. You can create close to the uh, actors, the audience very close to each other, listening differently. You can write different kinds of verse indoors because you can, and you can act differently indoors because you're so close. So in a sense, it was a transforming experience, I think, for the London audience once they could see this on a regular basis. And I think also, you at court, you've got obviously indoor performances, and it seems to me inevitable, uh, I don't have any particular evidence for this, that because the professional actors took their plays to court, they also participated in the court entertainments, they would have brought back some of what they saw from the court and found, as in my experience, theatres often do, a cheaper way of getting the effect. So that at court, for example, they had crystal chandeliers. You don't see that in indoor. But they would often put um, wire with glass to catch the light. Well, you can do a cheaper version of that. And I, so I think they also learned from the other things they were doing. It must have been brilliant. At the end of the 16th century, the 1590s, uh, you get this, there's this group of young playwrights. Uh, you've got Ben Johnson's probably the oldest of them. Uh, and Johnson, of course, comes from a very ordinary background. I mean, he's as bright as it's possible for a person to be, even as bright possibly as he thought he was himself, I think, at times. But, and then you've got Marston, who's been at the Inn of Court, um, doesn't want to be a lawyer, his father was a lawyer. His father's clearly not pleased that he doesn't want to be a lawyer. He starts to write verse satires. In 1599, the bishops ban verse satires. Marston starts to write satirical plays. Uh, Ford, later, another inn of court uh, student, he'll start, he only ever writes indoor plays. So at the beginning of the 17th century, you get this... Uh, class of plays which we call city comedies, uh, which are largely but not exclusively indoors. And they start, I think, to be satirical plays about London uh, and about the uh, venality of the, the city. When Johnson writes The Devil is an Ass in 1616, the devil comes to London and they can't believe that London is far worse than hell. Uh, and these early city comedies performed by the boys, uh, the children, uh, in the, the indoor playhouses, are basically satires about London. They're all set in the city. And even when occasionally they're set elsewhere, I think A Mad World My Masters is in Bedfordshire, it's really London that they're about. And their, their plays, their sort of intrigue comedies, very heavily plotted. And I think the complexity of the plot of the play is, as it were, the theatrical form of the complexity of the plot of the swindlers in the city. So I think the playwrights are saying, you know, crime and business, it was ever thus, are not always very far apart from each other. And we're going to write plays which, in a sense, catch that in the form of the play. So that's one very distinct form. And then I suppose the second distinct form that is initially an indoor play is the tragic comedy, which is really the only, I mean, is, a, is an invention of the Jacobeans and I suppose is largely led by Fletcher, who is, of course, after Shakespeare, if you were talking now to a Jacobean and you said, who's the most famous playwright? They might say Shakespeare. They'd probably also say John Fletcher, but we don't know his work so well now. And that, those plays that kind of uh, uh, are uh, 
are no comedy because they come near to death, but are no tragedy because there is no death in it, which I think might be Beaumont's definition of a tragic comedy. They are very distinctive um, of the indoor plays. And then I think you get what interests me is in, in 1612, Webster writes The White Devil. Now, whether he hoped it was going to be done at the Blackfriars or not, it wasn't. Uh, it was done at the Red Bull, a rather damn market playhouse. And Webster writes in the preface to that that it didn't stand a chance. It was done in the wrong theatre to an audience who weren't bright enough to recognise its merits. And so I think when he wrote two years later The Duchess of Malfi, he wrote a play so clearly designed for uh, the indoor playhouse. So you get tragedies, and then I think you come up into the late 1620s, and you then get John Ford, who is the sort of perfect indoor playwright. Uh, and Ford's plays, I think, when you see them done in a space not dissimilar to an indoor playhouse, it's, you know, it's like if you suddenly put on a, shoe, a pair of shoes that fit perfectly. The play and the space just sit together so perfectly. And Ford understands exactly the level of dialogue, the nature of action. The, you get plays that are much more interior. You get, uh, you get duels. You don't get much fighting because the stage isn't very big and the audience are sitting there as well. So often in these plays, they get very close to fighting, like in the opening of Tis Pity, She's a Whore. They get very close to having a duel, but they stop just before it gets interesting. So you can see the playwrights thinking about how the plays will fit indoors. And, and I suspect that Ford played on the Globe stage would seem... I don't. I've never seen that. Uh, I think it would feel uneasy, in a way that it doesn't indoors. So I think you get kinds of plays, and then you get the way plays themselves are shaped to the indoor opportunities. Well, I, yes. Although it's interesting, I think we people often say, you know, what did the audiences think? Well, of course, they don't really know. But I do think that you can tell from the plays that the playwrights expect the audiences to be able to hold quite different opinions at the same time. And what interests me with the plays as well is how we sometimes think of audiences as kind of homogenous. I think they knew that you've got quite a, you've got a number of rich merchants You've got a number of aristocrats. You've got a number of women in the audience indoors now. Uh, you've got uh, this bunch of young men out to show off on stage. I think the plays are quite good at sort of factionalising and getting a dynamic in the theatre itself. I think with these plays, you're not just watching the play, as it were, you're in the event. Uh, and the the tensions and cross-currents in the play will be the tensions and cross-currents. So when in Eastwood Ho, you've got the presentation of Touchstone and Golding and Mildred, the solid middle-class bunch, then you've got Quicksilver, who I suspect a lot of boys on the stage who comes from a different class recognise something of, uh, and then you've got the usurer, security, everyone's bugbear, everyone's bugbear, the usurer. So you've got, and then you've got Gertrude with her aspirations to, you know, wanting to wear good, the best clothes and completely taken in by Sir Petronel Flash, what a name that is, uh, who is one of these new knights, uh, which is what got the play into trouble, of course, that satire. So in a sense, there, I think it's true to say that city comedy is done outdoors are probably gentler towards the merchants and plays done indoors are gentler towards the aristocrats. But I'm not sure that would hold as any kind of rule. So I think my sense of the audience is, as I say, they're, they're very good at, at entertaining different and provocative 
provocative ideas. Of course, when these plays were done by the children, and of all the things about early modern drama, the thing that after quite a lot of years of thinking and watching, I still am puzzled by is the children. You know, Eastwood Toe, done by children somewhere. Well, they must be younger than 14, because 14 to 17 is the apprentice age, the age of the young men who played the women in the adult companies. So we're talking about children between 9 and 14. And whether that allowed a sort of licence for the plays, uh, I, I'm not sure. And it maybe it gave them... Uh, it, it, someone uh, described Marston as howling from the margins, a kind of freedom in what he said. And I wonder to what extent the children allowed them a bit of freedom. I mean, I know that when they did Eastwood Ho, it caused a stir. Marston, for some reason, isn't implicated. Johnson and Chapman are in prison and, and writing saying, why are we being punished for another person's fault? Because trying to lay the blame on Marston. But I, I think that may have something to do with it. And, and on the whole, I think uh, later, censorship of plays which are uh, provocative tends to be only when there's a particular political uh, slant to it. Uh, so, so I think the audiences must quite have enjoyed uh, possibly the, the, the satire of another group within the audience as well, which is then turned on them. So I think it might have been quite a lively, uh, lively time.